title, Fear of God, Fear of Man. And uh, it's funny how these two things um, are related. And I'm going to try and prove that to you (laughs) this morning. Amen. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, conversation in the body of Christ at the moment about the fear of God. It has been for quite a while, and uh, probably more so in the last five or ten years. And a lot of it is surrounding about saying that we need the fear of God to come back into the church. And so it's. Um, It's something that's always bothered me because it's not that I'm opposed to the result of what people want from the fear of God. So the result that people want is people to come out of their sin. They want people to come out of passivity in the church. They want people to be on fire for God. And they want people to do what the church is to to do, which is proclaim Jesus boldly. And that's why people say we need the fear of God in the church. So I'm actually not opposed to the results of that. Like, I want to see that too. Amen? Don't you want to see that? What about what was Rick talking about this morning? Rick was talking about being more than just pew sitters and people who can read the Bible, but people who can actually be a portal for Jesus to come from heaven to earth and touch someone's life. That's what it's all about. This is what it's all about. This is what we want. We all crave this deep in our heart. We all know this, don't we? We all want more, don't we? We all want to see a situation in life at the supermarket. We all want a word of knowledge to give to someone who's struggling. You know, we all want to be able to go lay hands on the person in the wheelchair, you know, somewhere. Um, You know, don't we? (laughs) Come on. We all want to be able to witness powerfully to the person at work. Come on. We all want to see the power of God you know, manifested in our life, in the church. This is what we all want. So the conversation at the moment through the prophetic voices is we need the fear of God to come back into the church, to wake everyone up, you know, to fear people into doing the things of God. That's, that's what I'm not comfortable with. And, and I believe there's a lot of scripture and my own life experiences that will help us, you know, Um, get to that place it's like in a little bit of a way uh, the same thing about grace there's always been a lot of opposition to the message of grace because the first thing that people will say in opposition to grace people they'll say people don't need grace people need a kick up the backside you know (laughs) for the same results I was just talking about, you know, to, to straighten their life up. And they say that grace is a license to sin. So if we just give people grace all the time, that just gives them a license to do whatever they want. That'll never get them on fire for God. But that's not what the Bible says about grace. It says the opposite. It says that grace is the antidote to sin. Grace is what stops you from sinning. And so... The fear of God is very similar. It's just we need to get the right definition of the fear of God. We need the right definition of the fear of God because the fear of God will bring about those things in the church, but we need the right fear of God. Right believing leads to right living. Amen? Such a powerful statement. I think it came out of Joseph Prince's ministry. In fact, I heard Creflo Dollar quote that the other day. And so... It's so true. What you believe leads to the way you live. So if you believe you're under grace and that there's no separation between you and God, the power of sin is actually taken away. Because the Bible says that it is the law that drives you to sin. The more you hear about what you shouldn't be doing, the more you actually do it. Anyway, we're not going into that today. That's not the message. But the end goal is the same. The church on fire, people in victory, bondages falling off, boldness to preach, passivity gone. The fear of man gone. And this is where this ties in. The fear of God will help you to overcome the fear of man. This is the whole point. The right fear of God 
will deliver you from the fear of man. We don't realize as a society and as a church how much the fear of man keeps you in bondage. It is huge. It is huge. And this is the one thing I love about Jesus and the, and, and the thing I love about leaders who stand up. And you can obviously see that they rattle a lot of people's cages because they're not afraid of man. They're not man pleasers. And because of that, they upset a lot of people. But the one thing you can always do with someone who's not a man pleaser, whether you agree with him or not, is you can respect his stance because you know what side he's on. There's too many people in society trying to please everyone all the time. And, you know, the bottom line is we don't really respect those people. And this is what I love about Jesus because his whole life was never, ever about pleasing man. As in, you know what I mean? Because the fear of the Lord was on Jesus, he actually blessed mankind. Because his priority was to please God and do what God said first and foremost, man got the blessing. But we try and do it the other way around. We think if we do everything for man, that he'll love us and he'll love Jesus. But that's actually not right. And that's in the church anyway. But the fear of man causes us to live a life that we actually don't really ever want to live. Do you understand that? We're going to get into that. So we need a right picture of what is the fear of God. Okay, so let's just leave that for now. What is the fear of man? What is the fear of man? So let's put up that scripture, that first scripture, Hayden, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be kept safe. And then, I don't think I use the same thing that Rick uses, the Google that he uses, but I was Googling some stuff last night, Rick. And uh, this is what I got out of Google. And uh, it says, the fear of man, it is the fear of man that makes people compromise on what they believe. It is the fear of man that causes people to look to others and public opinion to know what to do and believe about life and worldviews. I'm actually going to read a few of these statements out today, so you might have to, I don't know, go back and listen to the message, because I think you need to spend time on some of those statements. It's really true. It's not hiding in your house, afraid of man. It could be if you're on, you know, like Pastor Dan, extreme anxiety. And I've been in that place as well. I've been where I just didn't want to see people. It could be that. But that's not what I'm talking about. It's about people who are engaging in society and we always allow what other people think of us to determine our life. It's called being under bondage. It's called being controlled by other people and other things. Amen? Who wants to get free of that? Come on. I love people in society who break the mold, whether they're doing the things of God or not, just simply because they're not afraid to be different. You know, I, 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 I did state Billie Eilish a couple of months ago on a message. She's out there, man. She is different. But you know what? One thing she doesn't care about is what people think of her. Whether you agree with her life choices or not, that's another whole thing. But anyway, good honor. So I've tried to say to my kids because... Right from the, the, their young age, they're always being impressed about what they should do and who they should be and what's cool and what's good and what's not. And this is just as much a challenge for me in my life, in my, in my area that I live in. Fear of man. What will man think of me? Where you want to go and what to do with your life is undergirded or controlled by a need, listen to this, to be perpetually affirmed by an individual, a people group. Now, that people group could be your family. We know how hard it is to tear away from our family. You know, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't believe that. Oh, you're not doing this, are you? Oh, you're not making that decision, are you? Oh, you can't be doing this. Oh, you're going to move away. Well, you're going to move away because Jesus said to move away. <laughs> are you a lunatic? You know, it can be, you know, a sports team you're involved in. It can be social media. It's in your school. It's in culture. 
It's in everything. It's in, it's in front of us all the time. People tell us how to dress, what to wear, how you should do your hair, what's the latest this, what's the latest that. It's just intoxicating. I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, follow some of those things. They're all good. I think it was a good idea that I got my hair cut short. <laughs> Bald hair's in, isn't it, Pete? Yeah, come on. It'll probably be two pays in 2030. We'll have to go and get one of those, Pete. Anyway, it won't be me. <laughs> you know, disclaimer, <laughs> you know, you'll be working on this till the day you go home to be with the Lord. It's the same thing. Every time I get a message, I start being introverted about how this is in my life, where this is in my life. And I can see areas where I've broken free of that. And I can see areas where I'm still under the bondage of that. It's just the way it is, you know? And, and, and so I can see areas where the fear of the Lord causes me to make a decision about something. And I can see in other areas where there's not enough fear of the Lord, the right fear of the Lord, which we'll get into, where I'm still making those decisions. Amen? It means that instead of you and God in control of your destiny, someone... Or some others are. This is, the, this is the, the crucial thing. It means that you and God aren't in control of your destiny. That's not Jesus. We're, we're trying to walk in his, his footsteps, aren't we? No one pulled Jesus off the course of his life. No one. In any situation. When there was someone was dead... It didn't pull Jesus off the course of his life. When his mother called out to him and he was preaching, Jesus didn't run outside and say, hey, mum, what's up? <laughs> Come on. Jesus did what his father told him to do and didn't do it unless he was told to do it, not to do it. You know what I mean? People say to me, why am I still in Cairns for 30 years? Why am I still in Ark? You know, you've been in Ark for 20 years. Oh, you've been in Cairns for 30 years. You know, let's move out. I'll tell you why I'm still here. Because God hasn't said, go somewhere else. That's the bottom line. I'll go if God's in it. But that's why I'm still here. And I'm still here because I believe that that's what God has said. And this is where I'm going to prosper. Amen? Come on. That is the fear of God. That is the fear of God. It means more to me to do what God said to do and live in Cairns for 30 years, to go and buy some little chalet somewhere on a nice comfy beach in northern New South Wales where it's a bit cooler and I've got some waves. Come on. Jade would do that tomorrow. You need a bit of the fear of the Lord, don't you? <laughs> oh, who knows when you counsel your spouses it doesn't go down that well. <laughs> That's why a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The Holy Spirit do that work, no. All right. Because another part of that is because we have the mindset of this world and this life, and I've preached on this before, that this world and this life is everything. No, this world and this life is not everything. The next life is everything. And what we do in this life determines our next life. So if I get to miss out on a nice cozy beach on the northern New South Wales, I don't really care because I'll have all eternity to visit every beach in heaven. You hear what I'm saying? Come on. And that's because of the fear of the Lord, the right fear of the Lord. I'm not shuddering under a bush because I'm living in Cairns for 30 years. One of the big challenges to the fear of man, I'm going to probably duck back and forth, this is why they're interrelated, is rejection. So whether you've actually ever experienced rejection, which most people in society have today, you know, you're probably the odd one out if you've never experienced rejection in today's society. But if you've experienced rejection, especially from a, a parental point of view, OMG, you'll spend the rest of your life trying to be affirmed by everyone. And you'll never do what God says to do. Because it means more, because you need that affirmation. And, and God will take you through a healing process to, so that he's your affirmer. 
you're a firmer. Amen? But the world is under this as well. Because this is why I love John 3.16. Because the world, whether they know it or not, thinks that God is rejecting them because of their sin. He's not rejecting them. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. God is not looking on the world now to judge it. It's been judged. All his exhaustion of anger was exhausted on Jesus' body against mankind for now. So God is calling everyone to himself. God is loving the world. See, Satan just uses the opposite of what God says. Satan is trying to make you feel rejected as a Christian or a non-Christian. God is trying to say, you're not rejected. I, d I proved that to you. For I so loved you, you had so much value to me, you meant so much to me, I cannot live a second without you that I sent my only begotten son, that you'd live with me forever. That I'd allow him to go through the most gruesome of deaths, to go through the most um, levels of torment you can't imagine. I'd allow that. I'd allow my son to do that. I allowed it. I didn't stop it, and neither did Jesus stop it, because mankind meant so much to me. It's the opposite of rejection. But rejection will cause you to follow man. This is why before Jesus started his ministry, this is why before he actually went into the desert to be tempted, and before he started his ministry, he was baptized by John, and we know the great story, that the Holy Spirit came down and said what? This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Every son needs to hear that from their father and their mother. It's funny, isn't it? The Bible just doesn't throw things out there for no reason. It's not there just because they needed to fill the page. It's because Jesus needed it, because he's about to go into the desert and be tempted by the enemy, just like you are every day. He's got decisions to make in 40 days' time. Choose God or choose the devil. He needs the affirmation of a son. Society is filled with people. This is the other fruit of the fear of man. Society is filled with people who want to blame everyone else for their life. When in fact, in many cases, it is the fear of man that has caused them to make decisions they hate. It's true. I know this is a slap in the face, but this is how you get free. This is how we get free. The Word of God sets us free. I'm not discounting the fact that the enemy does things to people. The enemy does things to people. He's out to wound you. He's out to hurt you. He's out to cause problems in your life. But we always get a choice to respond the way God wants us to respond, in line with Him. Amen? Amen? So, the antidote for the fear of man is, what is it? What? <laughs> I should have been a school teacher. <laughs> no, it's the fear of God. Did I say that? The antidote to the fear of man is fear of God. Come on. God, you're clever, you look. All right. So let's put up Isaiah 11.2, just a little bit of um, scripture. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of, this is talking about Jesus. This is in Isaiah, so this is before Jesus came. The spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Jesus had the fear of the Lord. It's good, isn't it? Okay, so let's put up Proverbs 14.27. Remember the words, the first scripture I gave you? The fear of man is a snare. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Just proving a point. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you can interpret that however you want. <laughs> that sounded good to me. If we ask the general, if we ask the church, a general church survey, and this is where you need to have time to think about this, because this is in me as well. I have to stand against this all the time as well, and I'll, I'll tell you how I do that in a minute. But if we asked the church a general survey and said, what does it mean to really fear God? Or what is it? What is the fear of God? Have you ever seen those cars? 
See this guy, there's this guy in Cairns drives around with fear of God on the back of his car. Why do you need to do that? Fear God. <laughs> Maybe. Was that like a big, tough statement? Fear God. Fear God. Fear God, mate, because he's going to get you. No, he's not going to get you, mate. He loves you. He's trying to save you. Son of man came to save. Should have a sticker on the back. Son of man came to save. It's the wrong interpretation of the fear of God. <laughs> does that make you want to go to God or does it make you want to run away from God? What do we want the church to do? What do we want the world to do? Run to God. Don't fear God like that. Come on. I think that the majority of us answer that question in a way of, because of a sin consciousness, and sin, <laughs> the world has a sin consciousness, whether they know it or not, and the church has a sin consciousness as well. In fact, you get more of a sin consciousness in church because when you're out of church, you actually didn't know what God required. When you come to church, you hear all the requirements from the old covenant, and you become more sin conscious, which is good if it brings you on to grace. <laughs> But if you just stay under a sin consciousness because of the requirements of the law, you're probably going to end up more bound in the church than you are actually out of the church. That was my life experience. Amen? But God held me and he kept me coming through. Many would answer with an ungirding opinion to some extent. When, if I asked you what is the fear of the Lord and what does it really mean, you'd give me some sort of a fig tree, fig leaf answer. Something in you would want to make you run from God. Something in you would make you feel like you're being judged. Something in you would make you feel like there's something between you and God. Fear God. The Bible says it all the way through. There's a lot of scriptures. Fear God and live. They did this because there was no fear of the Lord in them. What does it make you feel straight away? It makes you feel like you've got an issue between you and God. Some type of expectation of doom or judgment. That's the undergirding thing. When you hear people talk about the fear of the Lord, I guarantee you, when you saw this thing come up on the Ark Facebook, sort of fear of man, fear of God, what was the picture? And this is, I'm not bagging Hannah, but what was the picture that she put up? As a lightning bolt. Hello. <laughs> Heather and I joke all the time. Heather says, How's your week been? I say, I'm waiting for the lightning bolt to come. She goes, Oh, beauty. Why do we say that? Because it's a joke, but you know in yourself, if you haven't met the perfect requirements of God through the week, you know the lightning bolt's coming. I've got mates. I talk to them all the time about God. They go, I couldn't get in church, mate. The lightning bolt will come. That's their mentality. It's probably true. No, it's not true. The lightning bolt will come. <laughs> but that's sad, isn't it? See, this is the picture that's portrayed to the world, that God is rejecting the world. But God is not rejecting the world. God loves the world. Even in its biggest, worst, sinful state, there's nothing. There's no measure. There's no measure of sin. There's no measure of iniquity. There's no measure of evil that you can do that surpasses the work of the cross. Come on, or God, or Jesus didn't do a good enough job. There's a lot of blank faces looking at me. They're going, oh, that guy shouldn't. I'm telling you, it's, it's like we've already said this, this morning. We don't understand. We don't understand the measure of God's love to us. We don't. I don't. I'm in a growing process as well. It's unfathomable. This is why the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. My mind has conceived how good God is and how good heaven is. Come on. This is the thing. This type of fear of God can never bring about the right fear of God, which is based in love. Because instead of you drawing near or pursuing him, you are always subconsciously thinking, 
there is a distance or a void or something not right between you and him. That's what the wrong fear of God does. Is there anything between you and God? That's good, Pete. I've said this before. I'm open to being taught. I listen to messages on the fear of God. I defy you. I defy anyone who can have intimacy with someone they are afraid of. It's impossible. You cannot do it. You cannot have intimacy with someone you are afraid of. And Google helped me with this too. <laughs> Someone's saying, yeah, just listening to the world. Oh, shut up. The religious spirit. How can you have intimacy? So what is intimacy? Uh, again, I just, it's just a couple of things, a couple of Google things. Mutual vulnerability, closeness, connection, sharing your heart. Intimacy is into me you see. God knows everything about you, whether you allow him to see into you. That's called vulnerability. That's called into me you see. And then God reveals himself to you and into him you see. This is called intimacy. This is what God designed for us and mankind. Okay, so now let's have a look at this. What is, <laughs> what is, what causes intimacy issues? This is like a counselor's Nightmare. <laughs> 40 years of reading books. The first thing that came up was low self-esteem. Low self-esteem causes intimacy issues. Where would you get low self-esteem from between you and God? Feeling like you are not worthy, not good enough, rejected. That'll cause you to have low self-esteem, period, but with God, even more. So if you have a fear of God... What are you going to have between you and God? A low self-esteem. Come on, I'm trying to build you up this morning, guys. The second one was trust issues. So if you've got low self-esteem, low self-worth, what, you think you're going to trust God now that you're afraid of? You're afraid of God. Fear of God. Fear God. Fear God. Oh, but now just come into an intimate place with him. Oh, now just sit in your heavenly father's lap. Come on, I defy you. You can't do it. Third one, you've experienced anger. Who's tried to be intimate with their spouse when you've both been angry at each other? Well, if you think God's angry with you, mate, you ain't coming to an intimate space with him. Come on. God's fearing, fearful. Fear him. He's angry. He's not angry. Is he? See why we need a right picture of the fear of the Lord? You cannot have intimacy with God, and that is everything Jesus died to give you. It's opposing the very message of the gospel. A lot of people thinking out there, I know I'm smashing some sacred cows. I don't care. Bring it on. Romans 8.35. Can we get that up, please, Hayden? I defy you. I, I, you know, I don't know how anyone can come boldly. You can't come boldly to the throne of grace in a time of need when you feel like you can't get close to God for whatever reason. So what does Scripture say? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril of the sword? Okay, let's have a look at 38 and 39. Who shall separate you? Remember? This is Paul. He's talking to Romans. He's trying to get them to understand what their position is in Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, so that's demons, whatever, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ, who lives in you. Therefore, you have no separation between you and God. Your sins have been dealt with. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. 
Therefore, you can have intimacy with him. I said this. Simply, fear of God is this. When you desire to please him, when your desire to please him is greater than your fear of man, then you'll truly have the fear of the Lord. When your desire to please him is greater than your fear of man, then you truly will have the fear of the Lord. In other means, in other words, it means you will go wherever God sends you. You will do whatever God tells you to do. You'll say whatever God tells you to say. That's called the fear of the Lord. Because your desire, your heart, above all things, this is how Jesus walked. It meant more to him to do the will of the Father than anything else. The spirit, the spirit of the fear of the Lord was on Jesus. How about this? Intimacy with God deepens revelation. This is what I'm going to get to. We're going to start to explain some things. This is actually only part one, too, Pastor Dan. <laughs> so you have to give me another slot somewhere down the track for part two. <laughs> I, was, I was doing the message. I'm going, page nine, page ten. I'm thinking, it's not happening. To, no, it's not happening today. It's all, what, you're not enjoying this? What are you trying to say? <laughs> it's like, get him off. Intimacy with God deepens Revelation. Right? We all want revelation, don't we, of God. Intimacy is the platform for deepening revelation. Revelation deepens relationship. Amen? Relationship deepens trust. What was one of the issues of intimacy? A lack of trust. R relationship deepens trust. Trust deepens empowerment because now you trust God and God trusts you. Therefore, what Rick always talks about, now you can start to be used where God knows you can do what he said you will do and he can give you the empowerment without you thinking you're some superstar or whatever. There's a whole lot of things to that. Relationship deepens trust. Trust deepens empowerment. Empowerment deepens awe. This is where I want to get to. It's the awe of God where people are getting confused with the fear of the Lord of being afraid of him. Empowerment deepens awe. The, the, the quick study and awe deepens the right fear of God. Is that all too much to listen to? I'm not reading that back again. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get the tape. Awe deepens the right fear of God. When you're in awe of God, see, when I hear the people talk, teach about the fear of the Lord, it's like a bit of a safety net. They forget about everything I've just spoken about for the first 20 minutes. And they talk. And to, to be safe with the fear of the Lord, they talk about it's the awe of the Lord. You know, there's no awe in the church. There's no awe of God. Well, there might not be. That, that might be right. I just have a different way of getting there. The way I've just said. But God will use the awe of God to bring fear into the church but it's never to harm you. You see the point? Stop being afraid of God harming you. God is for you, not against you. God is with you. You are more than a conqueror. You are a son and a daughter. As parents, do we do this to our children? We who are evil, how much more good is our Father in heaven? Come on. This is what the quick study that I did when I, when I went through the fear of the Lord in Scripture. The thing about the awe of God, here's the crazy thing. So when, when the awe of God came in miracles in the New Covenant, right? When the awe of God comes with an angel, when an angel is presented before any man in the Bible, and there's, we know many examples. When the awe of God came at Exodus, at the Red Sea, when the awe of God came at Mount Sinai, when the awe of God came with Joshua, here's the crazy thing. This is what he turns up and says. <laughs> Fear not. It's either God or an angel saying, Fear not. Why? Because they're in awe 
and they're in a fear, but it's a wrong kind of fear. It's a wrong kind of fear. So the angel has to say to them, fear not. It's all good, brother. I'm with you. I'm on your side. Yes, God's amazing and he's powerful, but we're on the same team. I'm not joke. I'm not lying. This is what Scripture says. This is what Scripture showed me. A lot of the times, 90% of the times, an angel or God was saying, fear not. That's what he was saying. In, this is what a lot of people use about in Revelation for John. So John, we know, is a disciple who slobbered all over Jesus, couldn't get away from him, sort of like hanging off his leg as he's walking around. <laughs> right? We all love John. I love John. That would have been me. And then, but then we have a situation in Revelation where John's getting the, the book of Revelation and he sees the Lord in his manifested glory. And the Bible says that John fell down as a dead man. So John's got this relationship with Jesus on the earth, really intimate, really close, sitting on his lap. Jesus is not pushing him off. You never hear Jesus kicking him away. But then Jesus, John sees him in his glory and he falls down as a dead man. But guess what? Guess what Jesus said? Fear not. <laughs> Come on, John. I'm in a different state now. I'm in a different place. Things look different to where it was on the earth, but fear not. Come on. You've got to be running to God, not running away. Oh, Mr. Page. It's a pretty important page, too. <laughs> See, <laughs> I'm like Pastor Dan shares sometimes when you hear messages, she'll just switch it off because of what people are saying. Because it doesn't matter the name or the title or where they're coming from. There's something in her, there's an anchor in her that says, no, this is the God, this is what God has shown me in my however many year walk it is. And the same with me that says, I know where this is going. I know where this is going. And it's not what I want to listen to. Now, you could say, oh, that's wrong, that's right. But I'll tell you what, you can go down a rabbit hole of different doctrines and lose the freedom that's in your life. You know, if God wants to show you something, he'll show you something. And if you're open with him to say, I don't understand this message, Lord, and I don't really like what I'm hearing, but if you want me to hear this, then you need to show it to me. That's called the fear of the Lord. What I just said then is the fear of the Lord. It means more for you to know what God is really saying, the truth, than to actually just shut it off. But a lot of times we just shut it off. See, I will shut off anyone who tries to put separation between me and God. Because I lived for 32 years without a father. And it wasn't until God came into my car at 32 years and I broke down into a blobbering slob of tears and snot and felt the presence of my father for the first time in 33 years and showed me the very thing that was in my soul, the hole that was in my soul, the hole that was in my heart for 32 years that I had yearned for, that I would have crawled over broken glass for, that I would have walked through fire for, that I would have died for. He came and filled that hole in my heart. My father, my real father, was, was, showed me the thing that I wanted more than anything else in my life was a father figure in my life. Now, now, no one, no demon, no preacher, no scripture is going to tell me that I can't get near to my father again. No demon is going to tell me to be afraid of my father. I don't care what your doctrine is. I don't care what it is. I longed for a father for 32 years. You are not going to take him away by telling me I can't get near him because scripture just proves that I can get near him. And I stand against that every day. Because the church and the world tells you it can't happen. And I know it can. Because I've got a good dad. And Moses, the difference between Moses and the Israelites was that Moses went up to where it looked really fearful and he was drawn to the awe. And Israel, because of a sin consciousness, wanted to run away. That's the difference. I'm not running away from God. I'm running to God. I don't care how scary it looks. I've said that before. Why does my dad want to squash me like an ant? Don't you think he'll say, stop, Tony, if I'm going to die, coming into his presence? Come on.
I think that's the fear of the Lord. We're finishing up because I've run out of pages. <laughs> See, I knew it was part two. So, I just think that's the fear of the Lord. Can anyone resonate with that? See, I, you know, you could be anywhere else on Sunday. You just think you, you forget about it because you're in a habit of coming to church. So that's what I do on Sunday. You know, there's six and a half billion people. The last place they want to be is in church on Sunday. That's called no fear of the Lord. Duh. Well, you got to church. That means you must have some fear of the Lord. Not a fear of being punished, but something in you has a fear of the Lord. Something in you, the Lord means something to you because you could be anywhere else. No, you don't. He's on your side. <laughs> he already chose that, Pete, before you chose it. He chose you before you chose him. See, he's in front of you, mate. This is the whole deal. We don't have to prove that God's on our side. He's on our side. He already said it. He sent his son. Come on. We'll have a coffee later, Pete. Who likes Pete? So that's part one, guys. Part two, I'll, I want to get into the practical application of the fear of the Lord. I want to use men's lives in the Bible of what it looks like to fear the Lord. Amen? In a healthy way. So praise God. Bless you guys. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Thank <laughs> you.